official members bounce Bust off the chrome Realize it's real hell where we call home Official members bounce Bust off the chrome Realize it's real hell where we call home From the heart inside one I vision fat licks and mat clips The chrome will make the average imitator do backflips You lack a pistol So put a vest around the issue Sluts will never miss you Coming from members that's official all right, so today now we're gonna talk about uh, query optimization, query planning, right? How do we take a SQL query and generate a plan we actually wanna run? Um, before we get into that, the logistical things in the class are, uh, again, project two was due last night, project three came out yesterday as well. And then given that we were late in releasing it, we bumped it up another week. Uh, so you'll have now three weeks completed instead of two. So we do on November 17th. We will announce the recitation uh, next week. Homework for four will still be due uh, this Sunday coming up at, at midnight. Yes, question. Uh, does this mean the project four like, release date is going to be bumped, or is it still going to be bumped? We're going to try to release the project four. The question is, if project four release date be dump, bumped, we're going to try to release it sooner. And then given that we have potentially less time now to work on project four, we'll pare it down a bit of it. OK? Any other questions? And as far as I know, they haven't announced the uh, final exam dates and times yet. so. When? Oh, I missed that. Okay, all right. Friday the 13th at, uh, in the morning. Okay, whatever he said. Friday the 13th, and then we'll figure out, you know, if it's in the morning, we'll get coffee and donuts and cigarettes for whatever people want. Okay. Um, for, uh, for, again, for additional database talks, we have somebody today coming to talk about a database they built using Data Fusion for specifically designed for bioinformatics. And then Sonata is giving a talk the following week. They're a streaming system. And then InfluxDB is the only database company we've had talk three times here at CMU. Because uh, every time they come back, they're like, yeah, we made a mistake. Here's a new system we're building. So they came the first time. We told them what they were doing wrong. And then they went ahead with it anyway. And then came back the second time and said, oh, yeah, that was a mistake. Uh, we had to redo it. And then Paul is going to give, give a talk again with us in, in a few more weeks and saying, again, now they're based on data fusion. But before, they were using MMAP. And I told them it was a bad idea. Uh, and they, they were, they didn't believe me, and then I was right. OK. All right, so again, last class, we were talking about how to take a query plan uh, that some piece of the system generated, which we haven't really talked about, which today's about, and run it in parallel. I mean, prior to that also, too, when we talked about, first about query execution was how do we architect the system such that we can move data between the, the different operators, um, and you know, removing the whole tuple, part of the, part of the tuple, uh, batches, and so forth. And the thing we were talking about is, is at that level, was we were talking about these physical operators in the query plan. Right? It was no longer I'm doing a join in an abstract way. I was saying I was doing a hash join, or a nested loop join, or a cert merge join. Or I was doing my, I'm doing a, looking up a table or data from a table on the index, or, a, or the actual sequential stand on the table itself. So today's class is really trying to understand, OK, great. We know how to execute the queries now, but how do we get those query plans? How do we go from a SQL query and then generate the physical plan that we can then execute on our, on our system, right, using the processing model that, uh, that we talked about before? So that, that's what really today is about. So to set things up, let's do a really simple example here. We have a join on an employees table and a department table uh, based on the department ID. And we want to find up all, find all, name all the employees that work in the toy department. So this is the SQL query we're given. And then we haven't really talked about catalogs uh, a, a little bit, we have, but not in detail. But think of this, now there's some internal database of metadata about what's in our database. Here's the tables I have, here's the columns I have, here's the types that they have, here's the indexes I have on what tables, and is it clustered or unclustered? And some, as we saw before, some basic information about, I have you know, so many records, or so many tuples in my tables, and they're broken across uh, so many different pages. All right. So if you take this SQL query and almost do a little translation of it into relational algebra, uh, you will sort of end up with a, uh, a query plan looks like this, where at the, at, the leaf, at the leaf nodes, we have our scans on the employees and department table. Then we're feeding that up into a, a Cartesian product. Um, and then the output of that gets filtered based on the matches of the joins. Then there's additional filtering we're doing on the, uh, on the department name. And then we do a projection at the end to produce the, the, the employee name as the output. So if we want to start calculating the cost of this, because that's the thing we really care about now when we start picking, deciding what query plans we want to use for a given SQL query, uh, we need, again, we're going to use some, some approximations uh, or estimates based on what we have in our catalog to determine whether one plan is going to be better than another. 
So just quick back of the envelope calculations, what we can do here is say, okay, well, I, I know I've got to scan the employee table and the department table. Um, and so there's be 500, uh, 500 reads for page reads for this, uh, a million page reads for that. I'm just going to take all the output and just write it out to, to a temp file, right? So then now, uh, the, the, the next operator is going to take that temp file as this input, read it all back into memory, uh, do the filtering, and let's say again, that's, it's a foreign key join, which is back, back of the envelope calculation, we're going to say uh, you know, the, that a certain number of tuples is going to match, so we're going to only have to write out uh, 2,000 uh, 2, records. So then now we write that out into a temp file, T2, that this get, gets read in by the, the, the second filter. Uh, and then now, again, we're, we're doing some filtering. Say it's, it's, we'll have uh, 50 employees per department, right, assuming uniform distribution, which will cause problems for us later on. Uh, and then we'd write that out to another temp file, which you then just read it back in, in the, get the employee name and do the projection. Right? So for this gross approximation, we're doing about 2 million IOs, uh, which is not great. Right? And so the question is, okay, how can we start, in our query optimizer, start reducing this I.O. cost, because that's going to be the dominant thing for us. And again, whether it's coming from disk or coming over the network, at this point, it doesn't actually matter. Uh, you know, what can we start doing to start optimizing this further? Well, the most obvious thing is that we have a Cartesian product, which is almost always going to be the worst thing we actually want. Unless someone explicitly asks for a cross-join in our query, we, almost n we never want to be, be doing a Cartesian product or a cross-join. So we can just replace that with a, uh, a, a block-based or nested page-based nested loop join. And then now, to, you know, the amount of data we have to write out after you do the join is, is significantly less. We then feed this now uh, into our projection, or sorry, our filter operator, who's now reading less data. It's going to write out the same amount before. And then the, uh, the projection at the top is going to do the same amount of work. So now we got it down to 54,000 IOs. Again, just by just replacing that Cartesian product with a page-based or block-based nested loop join, right, we've, done, we've read less data at, at the leaf nodes. Can we optimize this further? Of course, we spent a whole lecture talking about crappy, uh, how crappy nested loop joins were. So what if we did something better, like a sort merge join? Right? Just again, by just replacing this join algorithm, uh, the, the decision we're making in our physical plan, like instead of using a, a nested loop join, replace the physical operator with a sort merge join. Now that reduces the cost of the amount of IOs we're doing by quite a lot. Now we're, we're down to doing 7,000 IOs for this one query. What's another thing we could optimize? We talked about query processing models, right? We talked about the iterator model, we talked about the materialization model, we talked about the the vectorization model. This is the materialization model, because I'm taking all the output of this physical operator, writing it out to a file, and then reading that file back in at the, at the, the, the next operator. Now, ideally, if you can keep everything in memory, sure, that'd be great, but let's assume, assume that we can't in, in this example here. So the materialization model is going to give us 7,000 IOs, but if I'm, if I'm smart about this, I realize, well, if I use that, then I'm not doing any pipelining. Uh, if I switch to a vectorization model, I get rid of the, the writes, the reads and writes down below uh, the leaf notes here. I still got to read everything in, but then I don't have to read it back in in the other operators. Right? So, so just by switching to pipelining, I'm getting down to 3,000 IOs. Now, in, a, in, in most database systems, nearly all database systems, they're not actually going to be able to choose between materialization and and uh, vectorization model, they usually just implement one. But if you then, if you are careful about how you organize and uh, what operator executes in what order, then you can avoid having to spill the disk unnecessarily and you can get, get more, better pipelining. Right, so this is, like, this is like an extreme case of like no pipelining, all pipelining, but it's a bit more nuanced when you actually do uh, further refinement of the query plan. All right, so now we're down to 3,000 IOs. Can we do better? What's another thing we said that we, we, that we can do when we start figuring out how to make the joins better? Swap the inner with the outer, right? And then obviously also here, I have this filter up here of filtering out the departments based on the name, the department name. Well, I clearly want to do that before I do the join, right? Because why do a, a, a join a bunch of tuples 
uh, on, on departments, and, on, and then it's going to filter out later on. So I want to consider swapping the employee with the department, and I want to also consider moving down the, the, the filter, the, the predicate, below the join. So if I do that now, switch flop this, move this down, slide this over here, right? Now the, uh, on the department case, I can start using an index, index, index lookup, because I have an index on the, the department name. Uh, where am I? Up, up uh, here, right? I can do a lookup on the department name. That's going to be fast, because now I'm do, just doing a lookup for give me the department where the department name is toy. That's a single lookup to get that, right? And assuming I still have to write out the mat and materialize, uh, materializing the output. And then now when I'm doing my join, I'm doing much, much less work on the join because I'm not joining tuples that I don't care about anymore. And in this case here, I just do an nested loop join because now I have a department ID and I have another index on department ID on, on the employee table. So now it's just a single probe to go get all the, uh, all the employees in that department, assuming that there's 20 of them. And then now I feed that up, and I'm still doing that final uh, projection on the, on the tuples at the end. So now I got it down to 37 IOs. We went from 2 million doing something really stupid to 37. So that's what today is really about. How can we get it down? How can we take a query plan that if we do the naive thing, again, a, say, almost a little translation of the SQL query into relation algebra. Now, there's not always going to be relation algebra constructs or everything in SQL, but a high level, I think you understand what I mean. But how do we go from something that's terrible to something that's good enough? And data systems are amazing. Like when you sit at the terminal and like DuckDB and SQLite and Postgres or whatever, when you write your SQL query and hit enter, it's going to do all this stuff for you and then, then run the query. It's very impressive uh, what these systems can do. All right, so today we're going to talk about, again, the, the, the high level background about query optimization is going to be about. Then we'll talk about the, ba the main two ways to do query optimization. One would be rule-based or heuristics, similar to what I shared here before, where like, I actually don't need to consider whether this is a good, you know, doing a switch is going to be a good idea. I mean, switching the, switching the join algorithm, that, that, that requires uh, more thought. But like, predicate push down is almost always you're going to want to do it. And so the bunch of rule-based optimizations you can do, and this is what most systems build when they build, build a query optimizer the first time, they're going to build something that looks like this. Then we'll talk a more sophisticated, more, more complex way to do this using cost-based optimization. We'll finish up then talking about what, how to actually do these cost estimates. All right, so I have three warnings for you in today's class. First of all, buckle up. This is hard, OK? The joke in databases is that if you try to make it in query optimization and you fail out and you can't do it, then your backup plan could be a rocket scientist. Because doing query optimization in a SQL database is much harder than doing rocket science. Whether that's true or not, you know, it's debatable, right? I would say also, too, the second warning is this is the part of the databases I know the least about, right? Uh, I, you know, today we're barely scratched the surface. I could talk about some of what the what other systems do, but like the the low level rules and all these uh, axiomatic things you can do to optimize qu uh, queries, it's you know something that I'm not really I'm not I would not say I'm an expert at all. You know who's the expert in this? The f sorry, I shouldn't curse. The German who wrote that Umbra system, <laughs> he wrote his own query map from scratch, right? So not only he has the best query optimizer, he has one of the best engines. It's insane. Sorry. Um, <laughs> And then last one would be, the good news is that, it's not really a warning, that if you're really good at this, I'm not saying this one lecture, will, you'll be an expert in this. Uh, we'll talk about 7.99 next, uh, at the end of the class. If you're really good at this, you can get paid a lot of money. Because the Davis companies, when they email me and say, hey, do you have students to hire? They always say, hey, do you have any students working on query optimization? We really want somebody who works on query optimizers, right? So this is always going to be demand the rest of your life because it's just so hard and every Davis system has to struggle, is going to struggle with this. And no AI and LLMs aren't going to magically make this problem go away. Okay. All right. So at a high level, what's going on here? So your application is going to send us a SQL query over the network or, or through a local connection. And it's going to hit our database system. The first thing we do is hit a parser. Right, the parser is going to take that SQL query and convert it into an abstract syntax tree. Now there's libraries now like SQL parser in, in Python. There's a, uh, sorry, SQL parser in Rust. Uh, there's libpg. Lib PG query in, in C++ or C. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, like there, there's libraries that can do this for you. Most systems now are going to try to speak the Postgres dialect, so there's, there's a modular version of the Postgres uh, parser you can get. So that's going to spit out an abstract syntax tree. You then pass into the data system binder. And the binder's job is basically take string tokens of, of database objects, like a table name, 
and then map that to some object ID or internal ID in, in the catalog, right? In Postgres, there's a PG class table that sort of, that where you store all this, right? But again, it's just making sure that like, if you reference a table that doesn't exist, the binder will, will check it. The parser is basically checking whether you're sending uh, malformed SQL uh, queries. So then the binder is not going to produce a, a logical plan. That's basically going to say, here's the joins I, you know, I want to do. Here's, the, here's the, the tables I want to reference. Here's the projections and filters I want to do. Again, but the logical plan doesn't specify how to do it. It just says what you want to do. You then pass that into the optimizer. And depending on whether or not it's doing uh, cost-based op optimization, there will be a cost model component along with the catalog. Well, it's usually sort of the statistics in the catalog anyway. But there'd be some component that's going to say, OK, for different physical plans I could have, for the logical plan I was given, here's the ones that I expect to take the, uh, the least amount of time to execute or have the lowest cost. And then this will crunch for a while. And then at some point, it's going to spit out a, a physical plan that you can then actually finally execute. So when you call explain in like Postgres or DuckDB or SQLite, that thing coming out that you see, the tree structure, that's the physical plan. All right, so to just reiterate, the logical plan is going to tell us what, the, uh, what we want to do at a high level. And then the physical plan is going to say, for, for given, a logical, given the logical steps I want in my query plan, here's how to actually physically execute it. Like, if you want to access this table, use this index. Or do binary search on the, the, the sorted table. Or if you can do a join, do a sort merge join instead of a hash join. And you can even get more fine-grained things like do a hash join, but, but allocate the hash table to be this size when you run. Or use this hash function and so forth. So there will always be a one-one mapping between a logical plan operator to a physical plan operator, right? Like you could have a logical join and a logical order by, and then that could be collapsed down into a single uh, sort merge join because that, that gives you the order by property you want and does the join, right? And in some cases, too, you could, take a, you could get to your logical plan and break that up into multiple physical plans, right? So there isn't always going to be a one-one mapping between these, the, these different plans back and forth. And typically, you know, when we talk about the actual implementation, what will happen is you'll, you'll, once you have the logical plan, you convert it to a physical plan, you never convert it back to the logical plan, right? Because like it, does, it, it doesn't really kind of make sense to say, right, I know the hash join is the best thing I want to do. Why would I go back and lose all the information I've collected doing that optimization to go back to a, a logical join operator? You sort of, the transformation occurs in, in one direction. All right, so what are we actually doing at high level here? So query optimization is a really hard problem. Uh, it's been proven to be NP complete, or sorry, NP hard, if you account for the, the different join orders you can have. Just think of the like, different ways, different permutations that you can have for joins. That, right, so that by itself is, is going to be NP hard. So then now, the idea is that we want to find a bun bunch of different logical plan candidates. And then for each of these candidates, we're going to then try to estimate the cost of them if we're doing cost-based optimization. And then we, at the end, we either run out of time or we, we exhaust our search and we say, OK, here's the best plan I could have right now, physical plan. I'm going to go ahead and execute this. So the reason why this is really hard is think of like, here's the, 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 giant, the entire search space, the solution space for all possible uh, uh, query plans I could have for any, any complex query. And then there's no way we're going to be able to explore everything. So we need to be intelligent and decide, how do we jump in, to someplace inside this uh, total solution space and muck around or look around and try to find a reasonably good plan uh, in a short amount of time. Because practically, it's just not possible to do an exhaustive search. For simple queries, sure, like select star from table where ID equals 1, and you have an, you have an index on ID, you can find the optimal plan, right? That, that's easy. But when you start doing joins, and again, think of like six joins, seven joins, seven way joins. The craziest one I've ever, ever heard is maybe up to 1,000 joins. Because right, they're all machine-generated uh, uh, queries. It's, not, you know, it's coming from a dashboard, not like a human typing these things. In that world, you know, it, all, it, all comes, it all comes falling apart. Uh, nobody does those things well, except for the Germans. OK, because uh, they, yeah, they have another technique we'll cover later. OK, right, so this is the big picture of what we're trying to do here. And as I said, the two general approaches we're going to do are uh, apply rules and heuristics that can rewrite the query to remove things that we know is probably going to be a bad idea to do. Right? The predicate push down is the most obvious one. Like I want to do, I want to do filter things before I do my, my joins. It's not always the true. Right? You could have something like the predicate does in a very expensive calculation or makes a call to like OpenAI 
which costs money now, and maybe I want to do that after I do the join because I don't want to pay money to send, you know, do outboard, outbound requests. Um, but in practice, you almost always want to push that down. In some cases, we, we almost always have to maybe look at the catalog to understand what's going on. But uh, the key thing to understand about these heuristic rules is that they don't require us to actually look at the data. Because at this point, when we're optimizing the, 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 the query, we can't look at the data because the query hasn't even started running yet. MySQL does something, I don't know if it's a good idea or a bad idea, but they're the only ones that do, does this. I need to understand a bit further. In some cases, they'll actually run part of the query during the, during the query optimizer. They'll go run the part of the query, get back some information, and then say, okay, yeah, let me, let me, based on that, let me go decide how I want to do certain things. Some systems will do this for sampling to collect data. We'll cover that later. Right? But in general, you, for these rules and heuristics, you don't look at any, any data. And then the alternative, again, is going to be the cost-based search. These are not mutually exclusive. Most systems will do this one followed by this one. Postgres does this one a couple times, does this one, and then goes back to this one again, right? Because it's kind of a hack, but um, we'll, we'll, again, we'll cover these things later. All right, so let's first talk about how to do uh, the, the rule one. So the rule one is really about doing logical plane optimization. And then the idea here is that we're going to have these rules, basically patterns that we want to match on our query plan. And if we see this uh, pattern getting satisfied, we know it has a certain inefficiency that we want to remove. And then we apply a transformation rule to then do the rewriting to, to change things. And the basic idea here, here is that we're throwing away things we know are stupid uh, and kind of pushes the, the, the query plan towards the direction where when we have to do a cost-based search, which is more exhaustive, that we're kind of in the right location, uh, at least at a good starting point. So in this world, though, we can't do any comparisons to decide if I do this transformation, is it better for me or not? Because again, there isn't going to be a cost model that says this is one better, better than another, right? It's, again, it's sort of ingrained or Im implicit in the implementation of the rule. As database people building it, we know, again, predicate pushdown is going to be a good idea. Therefore, always do it, right? So again, in this world, we can't guarantee we'll be able to find the optimal plan. But in practice, this gets us in the right direction, which again, will help a lot. So these are the examples that we saw before, the predicate pushdown, right? And then now, maybe instead of operating directly on the, on, the, uh, on the query plan tree itself, I could operate directly on the relational algebra, because that might be, it's more compact and easier to do, easier for the, the system to reason about. So in this case here, again, I have the, the, the filter on department name above, above the join. I just want to move it down to be below the join. And so I can just re, you know, match that pattern either on the, the relational algebra expression or on the tree itself, and then go ahead and do the rewrite that way. And that's fast, right? And so typically what happens is when, you, when these systems get implemented, they'll be, uh, well, in some cases in Postgres, it's a bunch of if-then-else statements, which is not great. In other systems, you could define the, the rules, uh, maybe using a DSL, and then you set a priority, say, I always want to check for predicate pushdown first, then followed by this one, followed this one. In Postgres, it's a bit tricky because you have to do certain uh, rewrite rules in exact order, otherwise the tree ends up in an invalid state. Um, but in, in theory, should be, these things should be composable. All right, the other rule we saw before was doing the, the replacing the Cartesian product. Again, if I just see a, a Cartesian product with a, the filter right above it that actually has the on clause for my join, right, that's a no-brainer. I want to rewrite that into a, to an inner join, right, and you remove that filter entirely because the filter goes inside of now the join operator here. Right. Again, I don't really care what's above or below uh, me. I can sort of I just pattern match on this part right here, and then I just keep everything else the same because I know that again I want to get rid of the Cartesian product. It's always gonna be a good idea. And then the last one we saw before again it was projection push down. If I know that I have a, a projection above a join, that's gonna throw away most of the data that, that I would actually need, or that's not throw away most of the data that, that's coming out of the tuple then I may want to duplicate that projection operator to be below the join. And then now I can do a calculation and say, OK, what's the minimum number of attributes I need for this table feeding up to the join? And filter that out, uh, project that out, so that I'm only passing up the, the small number of records I need. Now here's where you imagine a cost model could actually help, right? Because if my, if my, my table has three columns, then spending the time to actually do this projection 
and copying data from, you know, from the, the scan into the, the join might be actually wasteful. But if my table has, I don't know, 10,000 columns, then yeah, this, this projection pushdown would be a huge win. So oftentimes in these rules, you'll see hard-coded values. You'll see them in the cost models too, where like someone says, okay, yeah, 10. If it's more than 10, yeah, do, do the, proje the projection pushdown. If not, don't do it. Yes? So is projection pushdown helpful for row store debates? The question is, is projection pushdown helpful for row store debates? Yes. So my example, again, if I have 10,000 columns, and I can calculate my optimizer that this query only needs two of them, then I can throw away the other you know, 9,000 of them. Right? So it's not, not just column storage. Because again, like, think of like, in my example of the materialization model, I was, I was copying from one upper to the next. Right? I'm, I'm wasting space copying those extra, those extra columns that I'm not going to need. Right? And even, even if it's pipelining, I can, I can keep more things in memory if I'm not polluting with, with data that I don't need. At the end of the day, the goal of, of the query optimizer is really trying to throw away as much useless things as, as quickly as possible at, at, at a reasonable uh, uh, computational cost. All right, so again, like the, pretty much every single data system is going to do some version of, of these kind of rules because, again, they're fast, they're easy to implement reasonably, and then, they're, again, as I said, they're almost always going to be the right thing to do. All right, so now the next thing we have to discuss is to do cost-based search. And th this is the part where things, things get really tricky, right? And so the idea here, again, is we have this logical plan that we're converting to physical plans, but there's a bunch of different candidates of physical plans we could have, right? I showed the example of, like, I could do a, I have a join. I could do sort merge join, nested loop join, index nested loop join. And so I need a way to say, okay, of my choices to do this, this one join operator, which one is the, is the best one? So the question is, how do you actually start enumerating the different choices that I have and reason about them and decide you know, how to guide myself towards an optimal solution? I would say also, too, this cost model being, for this cost that we're referring to, this estimate, this is going to be an internal cost that is specific to a database system's implementation and is not sort of uh, comparable across other systems. Meaning, like, process is going to spit out a, a query cost estimate for its queries, if I take that same query run on MySQL, it's going to put out a number two and says this is the cost. Those numbers don't mean anything across systems. It's only for, for, do relative comparisons within the system itself. Because certainly also, too, if the data changes, the hardware changes, or all the parameters and tuning of the system changes, those costs actually might change within uh, the system itself. All right, so in our example here, we're going to start with a sort of the most basic uh, cost-based op optimizer. Uh, to bottom up cost optimization. And this is actually the first cost, uh, cost based optimizer that was built by IBM in the, in the 1970s. Right, so, and I, basically, IBM invented how to do cost based query optimization back in the day because, one, they didn't exist. And uh, two, they realized, okay, with something declared of like SQL, you need a way to, to compile it and generate a, an optimal query plan, similar to how your, you know, the, the C compiler compiles C code into a assembly or machine code. So what they're basically going to do is enumerate a bunch of different plans for the query and estimate their costs, and they're going to have a separate sort of paths or, or passes to handle the case when you have a single table in your query, multiple uh, tables in the query because you're joining them, and then the hardest one else to do is potentially also subqueries or nested queries. So again, the optimizer can be able to run for uh, enumerating all these different plans, trying them out, until either it realizes I've seen all possible uh, physical plans, and therefore I know which one is the best one like in, in the optimal case. All right, you can do that for single, single table queries. You almost never can do it for uh, above three, things get, things get tricky. Um, or there's, there's a timeout. Like in Postgres and MySQL and all these other systems, you can specify how, how long you want the query optimizer to actually run. Right? And again, the trade-off is going to be, say my query is going to run for 10 milliseconds. Do I really want my query optimizer to run for 100 milliseconds? Or maybe I just let it run for, for 10 milliseconds, and then I'll find a query that runs in 20 milliseconds, and I'm still ahead versus doing, you know, still running faster than just letting the, the, um, the query advisor try to maybe try to find the true optimal plan. All right? Again, the key thing, we can't do exhaustive search here because everything's going to be, because the problem's going to be NP hard. All right, so as I said, the, if it's a single table, this is easy because it's, it comes down to me, what's the first, what's the best access method for my query? 
right? Do I do a sequential scan, which is always the fallback method for, for a table? Uh, is, there, is, my, is my data clustered or index, therefore I can do binary search? Maybe I choose that. Or then I try to pick the index that is going to be the most selective for my query. Again, if it's a primary key lookup on, and you have a prime, you obviously have the primary key index, that's easy. Like select star from table where ID equals Andy and I have an index on ID, that's easy. Where things get tricky is now if you have like doing a lookup with the where clause on A and B, but I have an index on A and then a separate index on B, how do you handle that? Well, we saw how to do multi-index uh, scans before because you just combine together the two results and take an intersection. Right? So there's all those things. This is where we have to figure those things out. We want to talk about predicate evaluation ordering, but that also matters a lot as well because I want to be able to throw away as much data as I can quickly as possible. So therefore, I want to evaluate the predicate that's going to be the most selective right away. Right? If, if it's uh, find me all the, the email addresses that end with dot, dot cmu.edu versus all the names where the last name equals Pavlo, I think there's, I'm only here at CMU. So like that index on, on the index of name to find people named Pavlo, that's going to be way faster than looking at everyone has you know, dot cmu.edu email address. And then the, the query app members can then figure out how to reorder the, the, those predicates based on those cost estimates. Yes? But how would it know that there's less Pavlos than CMU? CMUs? His question is, how would you know that there's more Pavlos at CMU? Sorry, there's more C... How would it know that the Pavlo email, uh, Pavlo name is more selective yeah. than the email? We'll see this in a second. We'll have statistics in the catalog, basically histograms to keep track of what the data actually looks like. Right? You ne it's never going to be perfect. It's often really, really wrong. Uh, but it's going to be better than nothing. But you'll have some information. Also, too, you could also look in the catalog and say, like, um, well, say instead of looking up last name equals Pablo, where, where Andrew ID equals a Pablo. In that case, you know Andrew ID is unique, right? They have, some asshole had Pablo and they won't give, give it to me from t 20 years ago. I think these guys dead too and they won't give it to me. Anyway, like, that's a unique key. And you look in the catalog and say, I know I'm doing a lookup on a unique key and I have an index on that unique key because I have to have it to be unique. That's going to be way faster. Do that lookup first. So it's a combination of the catalog and some basic statistics we're collecting. Okay, so now, okay, simple, qu simple queries, sim or sim you know, single relation queries, this is easy. The tricky one's going to be when you have multiple tables. I'm going to show two approaches. The first one is going to be with the system R1, that sort of mentioned the classic approach, the bottoms up uh, dynamic programming style, where we start with nothing in our query plan. Right? We start with like, just, here's all the tables that I, I know I would need to join them. And then you build it up iteratively, uh, start doing the joins, and try to figure out what's going to be the best join ordering and the best algorithm as you go up. And then you just choose the one that has the best, call, the, the best path going down, getting back to the starting point. And then the alternative will be this top-down approach or transformation, where it's like a branch and balance search where you start with, at the very top, like this is what I want my query to produce as an output. And then you work down, start adding in the, the operators to get you back to where, where you want it. Right? So the idea is you start with nothing. Uh, the first one is you start with nothing and build it up. The last one is you start with the, the, the answer you want and then permute it down to generate the plan you want. So I'll go through each of them. So as I said, this is the first, the, the first query optimizer built by at IBM. It's this bottom-up approach. Um, and what they would do is they would first apply a bunch of static rules that we saw at the beginning to, to throw away things you know are going to be stupid. And then they're going to do dynamic, ordering, uh, dynamic programming to figure out the best join order for the, the tables, basically doing a divide and conquer approach. All right? And as I said, most database systems that are open source are going to be using some variation of this. Uh, I don't know what ClickHouse does. The German Umbra system does a, a cocaine-fueled version of this uh, with hypergraphs. Uh, it's, it's very, again, we'll cover this in the class next semester. But this is the basic building block for that how most systems do uh, query optimization. So the way system R would work is that they would first break the query up into blocks, uh, sort of think of like a join in two tables. That would be considered a block. And then they would figure out the, uh, for the logical operators of the block, they want to figure out how to do the, 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 pick the best join algorithm and the join ordering within that block. And you sort of construct together now the query from all these blocks that, that you're, 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 you're building up. But one of the key design decisions that they made in their implementation is that they would only consider what are called left deep trees. 
So a left deep tree would be like I'm joining A and B, and then the output of that I join C, and the output of that join it can join with D. Contrast this with a bushy plan, which is something like this, where you would join A and B. I join C, that produces some output, and then I join the two joins together. Let me take, I guess, why, uh, why did IBM decide to throw, throw away the bushy plans? He says, the hard to construct a lot of pieces. Yeah, so one, that's one answer, right? That you, if you just throw away any of these, any bushy plans that look like this, or anything that's not a left deep tree, that cuts down the search space quite a bit, right? All right, so why, why would they only want to consider these then, right? Because I, I could just say, oh, I'm only taking bushy plans, throw away all the left deep, right deep joins. So why only do right deeps? Pipelining, right? I join A and B, and then the output of that, uh, as those tuples come out, Right? I can then just feed that up now, join, join with C. So what you could do is, say you're, you flip the order of this, say now you're gonna build, these are all hash joins. You build all the hash tables in B, C, and D. Do a first pass on those, you build the hash table on those guys. Right? Now you come back and take A, and you can write A of the pipeline, you never have to spill out the disk. If you say, okay, do my A, check to see what it's in the hash table for B. If yes, check to see what this hash table is C. If yes, check D, and this over produce your output. Right? So if, if B, C, and D are really small, you do one pass on over them, build your hash table, then now A is the really big table, and I'm just scanning through that once, doing my probes in all these hash tables and see whether I have a match. I can optimize this even further, as, again, as we talked about before, like as I'm building the, the hash tables on B, C, and D, I can build the bloom filters on them as well. And then now as I ride this up, it's even faster because you know, if, if the 2.8 doesn't pass the bloom filter, I never have to go, you know, you know, I don't even, even probe the hash table. So I can keep those bloom filters in memory and only go, get, go to disk, get the, get the hash tables if necessary, if I'm, if I'm really constrained on memory. Right, so they, they do this for pipelining, and because, again, it's 1970s, the computer's really slow, uh, and memory's really limited, it cuts down the search, search space a lot. Yes? When two operators are, com two operators are communicating through memory, do they go through the buffer pool? The question is, when, uh, when operators are communicating through memory, do they go through the buffer pool? T typically, doesn't that, they don't have to, but if you think you're going to have to spill to disk, then you want to basically have temp buffers that you write into that could spill to disk. So in Postgres, yes, they, 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 they will be backed by blocks that can, can spill to disk. In other systems, they could say, all right, well, I want to run fast as possible. I, if I run out of memory, I'll just reject the query. Right? right? And then you come back and say, give me more, mem more memory. You could do that. Right? So if you have to spill to disk, it has to be backed by the buffer pool. But as we talked about before, it's, it's, a, it's like this temp space, a scratch space that's assigned to your as a query that nobody else can read and write to. And, and, and it could get evicted, sure, but it's not like someone else is going to take the page, the, the page lock on it while, or while you're running. All right, so let's look at a more, more, uh, more complex example here. So now we're doing a three-way join on a... The sort of Spotify example, we're going to find uh, all the artists that appeared on my remix from a few years ago, and we're going to sort it by uh, artist ID. So we're doing a join between the artist table, the appearance table, and the albums table. Right, this is the example we showed the first day of class. So what system I would do is the first thing you got to is say, okay, I, need, I know I need to access the artist table, the appearance table, and the album, ta album table. So let me just choose what's the best access path uh, for each of these. And again, you can just do this in the catalog using rules and say, all right, I know I got to do a sequential scan on artists and appears because I don't have an index that can satisfy any of the predicates in my, my where clause, my join clause. But in the case of album, I can, I'm doing a lookup on name and I have an index on that, so I, I can use that. Then now you're going to enumerate all the possible joins that you could do for, this, for these three tables. Right? Because this is PowerPoint, I can't show all of them. Right? But it's not only, you know, am I doing inner joins, but also for all the Cartesian products as well. And then now you can determine the join ordering on the lowest cost. Again, the rule you apply is you need to throw away anything with a Cartesian product because you don't want, you don't want to consider that. Uh, but now it's really now trying to figure out for the ones that are doing joins, what's the, what's, which of these is the best ordering? And then also which, which joint algorithm do I want to use as I'm scanning along? All right, so again, the, the system R optimizer is a, is a bottoms up approach. So we're going to start at the bottom here. That we just have this logical plan that says, I want to have, I have artists, I have album, I have appears, join them. I'm not saying what order yet, I'm not saying how to do it, but that you start, that, that's the starting point. 
And then the thing at the top is, here's the logical output that I want. I want, I want to produce the query result when I join these three tables. So in the first phase here, you then say, all right, I can have uh, different orderings of the do the joins. So I could join with artists and appears first, or album and appears, appears and album, and dot, 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 because it's a PowerPoint. This goes on uh, quite a while. And then now the path from that starting location at the bottom to the next stage, the next logical operator, along this path will specify, here's the physical operator I want to use to compute this, a hash join versus a sort merge join, or, right? And now I'm just annotating again with just the predicate that, that, I, that I'm using to do that join. So now, for each of these paths, I can then go to my call spot and say, OK, to join uh, artists and appears using a hash join, how much is this going to cost me? How much disk am I going to read? How much CPU could I potentially use? Or for the sort merge join, to do that same join, artists and appears, how much CPU, how much disk, or whatever else I want to use in my cost model, I then calculate the cost for, for that path. And then now for each of the uh, logical operators at, at the next level, I just pick whatever path at, that is the, has the lowest cost and throw away everything else. Right? Because under dynamic programming, the principle of optimality, if something had the lowest, lower cost going up here, uh, then in the global optimal, uh, global optimal plan, it has to be part of, uh, it has to be the lowest cost between this decision right here at that level. So at this point here, I don't know which of these three choices, or as it extends out, all the different choices of the physical path going at the next level is that has the lowest cost. But at this stage here, I know from here to here, this one has the lowest cost. And again, I'm only showing sort merge join versus hash join, nested loop join, all the different variations that, that we talked about before Could be, would be part of this as well. So now I want to do the same thing. So now I say, OK, now I have artists and appears, and I'm joining with album. And then likewise for all these other guys here. So now I say, well, what's the path, the, the different join paths I could take up to get me to my final, final result? Permute, or permute all the possible, or enumerate all the possible uh, join algorithms I could have for each of these. Compute the one with the lowest cost. Throw away the rest. And then now I want to say, OK, now that I, since I'm at the top, I have multiple paths to get me down to the bottom. Which one is going to have the lowest cost? And that's the one I'm, I'm going to choose. Make sense? This query is actually, this, this plan is actually not even correct though. Right? Because what's wrong? Going back here. I have an order by clause. Right? But in my, when I choose my path going back here, there's no notion of ordering here. Right? So one of the limitations of IBM's first implementation of a query optimizer is that they had no notion of the physical properties of, of the data. Sorting is the most obvious one. Um, you can imagine compression and other things, right? So the hack they would do to make this all work, and modern systems can fix this, um, the hack they would do is that they would keep track of the plans that had, with and without the, the, the sorting property, or whatever the physical property that I cared about, and then they would check to see whether, for the plan that didn't have that guarantee, that physical property, if you tack on whatever operator you needed to make it conform to the property you want, like add, it, add an order by clause, add a sort clause or operator above the join to get it to the, to the, the form that I need, if that cost was less than the, uh, the one where the, the, the query plan satisfied that property, then I would choose that one by just adding at add that sort thing. So they were using the cost model to get it to, to determine whether the physical property was what actually what I needed to produce the actual correct plan that I wanted. Make sense? Yes? So is the cost of a hash join for one query, will, will it be different for a different query, or will it all be the same? This question is, is the cost, for a, is the cost of a hash join different per query? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, This question is for a. This uh, question is if, if for a, if a join a query with an order by clause, wouldn't the the sort merge join always be better? No, hash joins are hash joins are proven to be uh, uh, algorithmically better than more efficient than sort merge join, right? So maybe the case, depending on what the the data looks like. Uh, doing the hash join, making the data unsorted, then doing the sort afterwards, that actually would be the cheap, better way to do it. Right, because 
say the hash joint only produces two tuples, then, then that would be, you know, that, that's going to be just faster because then the, the sort, sort cost is so small. Maybe even another way to say is, maybe what you're asking is, is the hash join cost always going to be the same regardless of what query I'm looking at? Yeah. No. It depends on the data coming in. Depends on the join clause, how selective that is, right? Depends on the hardware. Depends on how much memory you have. Depends on all these different factors that are very hard to, to determine and estimate. It's very hard. Yes, there you go. <laughs> the light bulb just went off. Fantastic. Yes, this is super hard. Um, I mean, you, so you can play some games of like recognizing if, if the data hasn't changed. Like I've never seen an update, insert update qu query, and I see the exact same query over and over again. Could you reuse the? If, if, you know, could you reuse these estimations? Yes. But oftentimes that isn't the case. Yes. If we're only keeping track of the best path, isn't that more like a greedy approach? So questions are do you only keep track of the best paths? Isn't this yeah, so this is not gonna be the global optimum. For the choices that we're considering, this this path down will be the global optimum. Right? Again, pointing at the system R, they're only considering the, the left deep trees. The bushy plan actually might be the, the, the global optimum. But they're not even gonna consider that. The newer modern systems will consider bushy plans. But it, I'm just I'm highlighting the system R one because that shows you like things you can do to cut down the search space. Because you, you can't exhaustively look at everything. All right, let me talk about the, the top down optimizer. Um, so I'm I will say I'm to me I like the top down optimization approach better. This is what we're building at the new system we're building at CMU does this. Um, the the Germans disagree, uh, and for me this is easier for me to reason about than the than the uh, than the bottoms up one. Um, but let, let me go through it and see what you guys think. So the idea here is that we start with the logical plan of what we want to produce our output from, and then now we do a, we do a sort of search down, traverse down, and start adding in the, the, the physical operators that get us to the, the approach that we need. And the idea here is that if we recognize that at some point of, of, the, of a branch that our best cost we've seen so far going down this branch, or the cost we have of the branch going down this far, is already worse than the best cost we've seen ever, uh, in, in, our, sort of in our search, we know we don't have to traverse down the rest of the branch because at no point is it gonna magically the cost going to get better because it can't do that. So this is what Microsoft SQL Server does. Um, and remember the last class we talked about Volcano. Uh, we talked about the, the B plus tree from the Kurtz Graphy guy. He's the one that invented this approach in the 1990s. He wrote a paper about it. It's called Cascades. It's indiscrutable. Like, it's very difficult to understand. Um, like you can't take that paper and build anything with it. Microsoft hired, hired him, paid him a lot of money to basically build up their new query optimizer in SQL Server in the 1990s based on this approach in Cascades. Uh, and in my opinion now, SQL Server, well, things I can't talk about, SQL Server probably has now, I would say they're going to reclaim their crown to being the best query optimizer, whereas the German one was the best for a while. The SQL Server one is, is getting much better this year. But we, we'll, we'll discuss that in the class next semester. All right, so what's going to happen here? Start with the logical plan at the top. We know we want to produce the a join with artist appears an album. We're also going to include the physical property we care about, that this data has to be sorted by uh, the artist ID. And then now there can be a bunch of rules that we're going to apply that are, that are going to convert logical plans to other logical plans. Like a join on AB can just be a join on BA. Those are equivalent, and I, I can do that transformation. But there's also going to be rules that convert the logical plans to physical operators. Right, so a join on AB, I would convert that to a hash join on A and B. And as I said before, when you apply these rules, you don't go from a physical operator back to a logical operator. It only goes in one direction. But the logical operators can, can get swapped around as, as much as they want. So now we introduce all the logical operators to build up our query plan. So we have the, the scan on the artist album and appears. And above that, we have the different join orders we would want. And again, assume this gets uh, blown out uh, for all the different combinations that we have. So then now we start at the top and say, OK, well, what operator do I need to be add below me to allow me to produce this output of a join uh, of these three tables? So I could add the merge join. In this case here, I'm doing a, uh, I'm doing a, jo a join on the, I have some input given to me that's a join on A1, A2, and then I, I'm joining with A3. So I have this sort of placeholder here thing to say, down below me, you're going to join A1 and A2. I don't know how it's going to be joined, but it's keep, I know that something's going to feed into me that's going to give me that result. So you sort of keep track of like what needs to be coming into you in order to produce certain results. So then now you come down here and say, okay, well, 
what below me would give me the join on A1, A2 and feed up into uh, the result of A3, right? So say now I have my, my join artist and appears as a logical operator, that would feed up into this, this placeholder here, and then the album is part of the scan of A3, and that feeds up into what A3 is. Yes? So when we say A1, A2, A3, we're still, like, it's, it's uh, abstract. We're... At, this, at this point here, you would have placeholders to say, some, somebody, somebody below me is going to give me A3 as the album table, right? I don't know how they're doing it, but I know they're going to feed up to me, right? And same thing with the join, A1, A2. Something below me is going to give me the join between artists and appears. I don't know how they're going to do it, but it's going to come up into me, right? And then now I iterate down here and say, okay, well, what, what would I need below me to produce the join of this? Well, I could have a hash join. Well, then same thing. How do I get the data in my hash join? Well, I have to feed in artists and appears, right? And then do the same thing. I could also have a merge join. So come same thing. What's the physical property of this and how, what feeds me into that, right? And as I'm going down, I'm doing cost estimates and say, okay, well, how much would it be this hash join given that I'm expecting this many tuples coming up from artists and, and appears? Or how much, what would the cost of being doing the merge join? So now there'll be additional enforcer rules we can apply to make sure that, again, the, the data coming in at our, at our, at from one operator to the next is in the form that we would want, right? So in this case here, again, I, my, my enforcer rule would say the data that comes at the very top has to be sorted on the artist ID. I don't care at this point at the very top how it got sorted, it just has to be. So when you have things like a hash join feeding into it, all right, hash join is inherently unsorted. So therefore, I know that there's nothing I need to consider further down from this physical operator because it's, it's not going to be sorted in the data that I need. But then I could have the uh, quick sort feed into me, like an order by operator. And then therefore, by adding that, now I, I can explore that further. But now I can do things like, okay, if that was being fed into me by a hash join, and at this point here, the, the, the cost of doing the hash join plus the quick sort is already greater than the, 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 the smallest cost I've seen for any possible plan, uh, complete plan in this, this tree, I know it, I don't need to traverse down further because it's never going to get magically better. Like, you, like the cost is always incrementing. It can't magically get faster for no reason. So again, this is the pruning thing you can, you can do here, but you can't do that in the dynamic approach, uh, programming approach. Yes? This question is, do you, does it use the enforcer rules since the beginning or after? It's always in the beginning. It's always part of the search, right? I'm just highlighting as, a, as an example here. Yes? How does it approximate the size of, like, join, like, if we're taking a top-down approach? This question is, how do you approximate the size of a join if you're taking a top-down approach? Uh, yeah, so at, at this point here, you would have to, you, you kind of need to go, you need to go to the bottom in some cases. But then you basically memoize all this information. So when you have to go to the bottom at least once and say, OK, what's the cost of the, this path going back up here? Like, how much data do I expect to get out of? I'm not showing the physical plans or doing the scans, right, versus indexes. Like, how much data would be coming out of scanning this table? And therefore, uh, and I store that in a, in a memo table. And then now when I go down a different path, I would say, all right, I know I'm going to join an A1, A2. Have I seen the path down to the bottom before? If yes, I can reuse that cost. Right, and then that allows you to short circuit. But yeah, you have to get to the bottom for at least once. So the guy that invented this uh, cascade stuff, the Gers Graphy, uh, when he won a test of time award at Sigmod a few years ago, he said that the best way to do this would be you do cascades first to generate a sort of rough outline of the plan, and then you would use the dynamic programming afterwards to do the join ordering. So he's actually, even though he invented this, he said you don't want to use this entirely, you want to use the uh, the hypergraph approach from, from the Germans to do join ordering, I, nobody actually does that yet. Um, but to me, again, I, I can reason about this much better than I can about the, the DP stuff. All right. So we got a lot, still got a lot to cover. Uh, let me try to get through the nested query as fast as possible. Just basically just give you an understanding of what's actually going to happen. And again, if you take the, the, the class next semester, we'll go into more, more detail. Nested queries are going are to trip us up because they're not really joins, right? They're these, these subqueries that you have to be reason about. Uh, and, you know, you don't want to do the stupid thing of, like, for every single tuple, 
invoke the nested query over and over again, because that would be super slow. So what you want to do is either rewrite them to decorrelate them and flatten them down uh, to joins, or extract out the nested query, run that once, almost like a CTE for the given query, and then inject the result into the, the call and query. The first approach is always going to be better. You're not always going to be able to do this. Uh, this is like the fallback choice. If, if, it, if it's, You can do that if it's not entirely correlated or not correlated. All right, so they have, a, we have a query like this. We're trying to find a bunch of sailors for a reservation. And you're trying to find people that all reserved a, a boat on a given day. So in here, we can identify that the, the inner query is referencing a, the, the outer query. So therefore, I could rewrite this now to extract it out to be a join. Right? This is the best case scenario because now I know how to make joins run faster. Instead of having to run for every single tuple in the sailors table, run the inner query, I can now just do my join and rip through that very quickly. Right? For the harder queries, again, you want to break up the queries into blocks, just like we saw on system R, and try to then reason about what to do with that one block at a time. Uh, and then in some cases, again, if, if, I can, if I can flatten them through rewriting, that's great. If I can't, then I just run it separately as, as if it was a CTE. So an example like this, where it's now a more complicated query, we're now inside this, we have a nested query that's producing an aggregation on the sailors table. And we're checking that for every single uh, record in, in the outer, outer query. If I can take this nested block, extract that out now to be a separate function, or sorry, a separate query, again, like a CTE, now at runtime, I can run that query at the top once and then inject the value, value there, right? And that'll run fast. The, the Umbra system and DuckDB can do the best, at least right now, at, at decorrelating these, these subqueries. Uh, SQL Server is catching up very soon. Yes? His question is, if you have a CTE, maybe a high level, what does the data system do with a CTE? Basically, yeah. It wants to rewrite it as joins. That's, that's, that's the ideal case. Um, yeah, because if it's something like this where there's an aggregation where no matter how times you invoke the CTE, it's always going to have one tuple, it's always going to just, just do a join for that. right? In this example here, you, you, could, you could rewrite that as, as a CTE. It would produce the same result. All right. Another thing we got to care about is how to handle expression trees. Um, right? The idea, again, that we have a bunch of where predicates in our where clause or on clause, and we want to convert them down to be the minimal amount of work we have to do while still also uh, producing the, the correct result for, for the given query. And so similar to we can have a rule-based system for, uh, for, for the query plan itself, we can have a rule-based system for doing pattern matching and rewriting for, expression, for expressions. For the, this one, you don't need a cost model unless you're doing reordering. But that's not really re rewriting the expression tree. It's just ordering the, the, the expressions as you evaluate them. Um, in most cases, again, I think in most cases, you don't, you don't need a cost model to do this. And most systems don't do that. So there's some obvious things you would want to do, like impossible predicates, like select star from table where 1 equals 0. Or you just do pattern matching on this to say, all right, I have two constants with an equal clause. Check to see whether they evaluate to true. And if not, you know, re just rewrite them to true or false. And in some systems, again, if it turns to false, Postgres and other systems can recognize I have an impossible predicate. And so instead of actually just scanning the table, looking at every single tuple and checking to see whether false equals false, it just bypasses running it entirely and says you get no results. More complex things are when you invoke functions. In this case here, this, now you've got to go in the catalog and figure out, OK, well, the thing you're invoking, what function is that? And can it ever produce null? In this case here, the now function, to get the current date and time, can never produce null. And you would know that in the catalog, say this function never returns null based on the return type. And therefore, you can rewrite that as false and then optimize that accordingly. For other things like user-defined functions, uh, it becomes more tricky. You may actually have to run the, run the, uh, the function to see whether it produces null or not. Um, in that case, it's just treated as a black box and you can't do any optimizations. Yes? Is what worth it? Sorry, to do this, do this optimization. Yeah, considering usually if, if you try to select something, your workflow is not going to be provably false. 
Uh, your question is, uh, your question is, is it worth, like, take this sample here. Is it worth doing this rewriting? No, I'm saying it's worth checking for that, considering no one will actually, like, do is anybody, all right, maybe you're asking, is anybody that stupid? All right, question. There is overhead in checking this. Now you're in, in like microseconds, right, to check this. So, uh, so, if your question, are, will people write these stupid queries? Typically, nobody would write where one equals zero, right? And and if you could argue, if you write that, that's your fault. Pay the penalty. But a lot of times, these queries aren't being gener written by humans. They're generated by these different uh, these dashboards that are composing the queries, and therefore it's like a nested, nesting, nesting. At some point, if, once you start evaluating things down, you may end up with a one equals zero. And, that for, and if I have a billion tuples, I don't want to check a billion tuples as one equals zero. I can short circuit that immediately. Yes? I guess my question kind of builds on that. Let's say you have like a human that writes very condensed good queries, and then you have someone else that just writes like 200 lines, tons of garbage, and unnecessary <laughs> things. Right? Like after the query optimizer, how close would the performance be? So your question is, if, is it, are they semantically the same? Yeah. His, his question is, um, if, I, if I generate some, have, it, have code that generates some query that produces you know, some result set, and, and the, the where clause and the join ordering, whatever, it's very verbose, versus the, a human written, a very tight SQL query, how close would the, the, how close would the optimal plans actually be? I, I, I mean, it's a cop out, but it depends on it depends on the data, it depends on the query, it depends on what query optimizer you're using. Like for much of the, the, the Postgres, it chokes on some really stupid things, right? Like it won't pick indexes if you uh, like if you do anything like order if you have like a where clause with a or, or sorry, order by clause with, with a a uh, an expression in it, it won't pick it. Like like if you do uh, order by ID plus zero. And ID is an integer. It's always going to be the same, it but it sees the plus there and says, oh, I can't do that, right? So there's, it, like, it depends on so many different factors. It, it, it's tough to say. The, the I would say that the machine-generated queries often are much larger, not because they're adding superfluous things, just because they're being generated by dashboards with, uh, with very large like, uh, selection sets and things like that. Um, I can't say who, but a, a very well-known cloud company you've all heard of and used, uh, like they have queries that have been coming out that are, that are 10 megabytes. Like the SQL string itself is 10 megabytes because it's a dashboard with these, these massive in clauses for every single possible combination and so forth, right? So, you know, so the complexity depends on so many different factors. It's tough to say what, you know, you know what, it's tough to say whether it's always going to be, uh, one is going to be better than another. Because you could argue that like, sometimes the, the more verbose you can make things, therefore the more information you could provide to the query optimizer, what you actually want. But again, if your optimizer is crap, they're, it's just, just going to choke on that. Yes? For a query engine, is it more common to process query written by human or by machine? This question is, uh, are most queries written by humans or machines? Most queries are written, by, at this point, most machines, computers. Right? Think about it. Like, you're on the web page. You load a web page. as a bunch of SQL queries. That's all generated by computers. Right? Okay. All right. There's a bunch of optimization rules. We'll, we'll, uh, these are two major ones. And obviously, one here, like, you have, a, have a, a disjunction value between 1 and 100, between 50 and 150. You obviously can just rewrite that into be a single between clause. And then that's much faster. Right? Again, there's a bunch of different tricks you can do to figure this out. All right. So now, the last 15 minutes, I want to cover uh, how are we going to actually do these cost estimations, as I've been saying. Like, how do you determine one query plan is actually better than another, right? So we have all these formulas that that's, that's gonna, they're going to tell us, like, short bridge join is going to cost this amount, and, and hash join is going to cost this amount. But now the actual runtime cost of these things are going to depend on what's being fed into them, right? So now to compute the total cost of this query plan, I've got to not only know how much data I have in these two tables, but now I need to know what's the selectivity of these predicates to say how many tuples am I going to filter out. Likewise with the join, how much data am I, am I, is going to get passed, you know, going to get filtered to get past the past the join operator that then feeds up now to my projection operator, right? And now the big challenge is going to be is that 
computing these estimations is super hard because we can't actually run the real queries because that would be too slow. Right? We, we just said it was MP hard. I can't run MP hard queries to figure out what the best one is and actually pick that. It is kind of what MongoDB does. MongoDB just runs all the queries and see what comes back first. And, they, and that's, what, that's what they pick. Uh, for join, if you have no joins, that's fine. Uh, but for joins, you, if you have, you know, the, the number of possible choices you could have would explode and it would be a bad idea. Right? And the problem is going to be, as we see this go along, like I, this lecture is kind of a downer because I'm going to tell you here's what you can do and here's why it sucks. And we don't really go into how to actually solve it because you know, it's not solved. But it's basically a house of cards. Like if I have crappy estimates coming out of this thing and I feed that into this and I have crappy estimates coming out of this, then that feeds into this. And I have crappy estimates coming out of that even further. So like, it's like crap built on crap built on crap. And beyond three joins, all this sort of, sort of really starts to fall apart. All right? But well, again, we'll try to get through it. Okay. So uh, again, we're going to use this cost model we have that's going to allow us to predict the, the behavior of the query plan for a given database state, meaning what the hardware looks like, what the data looks like, and what the, 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 the configuration of the system looks like. And we'll produce some internal cost number that tells us, say, one query plan is better than another, because it's simply too possible to run everything. And what the cost model is going to be comprised of is a combination of physical costs that says, here's how much CPU time I'm going to spend, or here's how much I.O. I'm going to use, or if you're really fine-grained, like here's the number of cache messages I would expect for one operator versus another. Um, and you sort of aggregate them, weight them, you know, a CPU costs more than disk and so forth, right? That produces some number. And then you can combine this also now with the logical cost that says, here's the number of uh, tuples I expect to come out of this operator. Here's the size of those tuples, like the number of columns I have, because again, that helps me figure out whether I want to do that early projection. Um, and then I could feed that into the next operator to say, OK, given this input, what, what is the expected output of the next operator? So the, most systems will do sort of a, co be a combination of the two of them. The high-end enterprise systems will do more of the first one. Like Postgres will do mostly just I.O. cost. Uh, I think SQLite is the same thing. But like DB2, when you turn it on, it runs a bunch of micro benchmarks to see how fast your CPU is, how fast your disk is, how fast your network is, and uses that as the constants to fill in for uh, this physical, physical cost calculations. Using Postgres as an example, they just have this notion of I have CPU cost, and I have I.O. cost, and the, the costs of them are relative to each other. Same thing with sequential versus uh, random I.O. The costs of them are just relative to each other. So there'll be some magic values or parameters you can set to say, you know, the sequential page cost the default is one, so now a random page cost will be some multiple of, of this. Right? Same thing for CPU, right? Going back here. I think they said CPU is uh, if you if it's in memory it's four 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 hundred X faster than reading from disk, and then sequential IO by default is four X faster than, than random IO. Right? And if you go read the documentation, they basically have this big warning here and say, like, hey look, like these are just you know, magic constants. You gotta figure out how to set them correctly if you want things to work right. Um, but of course, and then adjusting them can you know, end up producing widely different plans that may not be the best thing that you want. They can drift over time. Obviously, is, is your, is your, if you're having SSD, SSDs actually get slower as you fill them up more, right? because they have, there's less room for the garbage collector to move things around. So what might be the best uh, parameters for these things when your disk is basically empty will change when your disk is like 90% full. All right? Again, this is why the commercial systems try to run micro benchmarks to figure this out. All right, so now again, how do we how do we then try to estimate what what the input and outputs are going to be for these different operators so that we could then use something like a physical cost estimates to say here's how much work we plan on doing. So as I said before, there'll be uh, there's a catalog that every data system is going to maintain that has a query optimizer that's going to be that's going to maintain statistics about what data looks like and then use those statistics about to estimate the selectivity of different predicates. Uh, in different operators to then say how much work is going to be done. So most of these systems will maintain these things in the background for you, uh, but you can trigger them through, the, through these SQL commands like analyze or analyze table or update statistics. Like this causes basically a query to run in the background that does a sequential scan over your tables and, fi and then computes whatever, the, whatever internal representation that they have about, about the information, whether it's histograms or sketches and so forth. Right? Like in, 
in, in Oracle, I think it runs at like 9 p.m. or 11 p.m. every night. This thing will run as a, as a, a cron job and recompute all you know, new data for you. In Postgres, I think it, it gets triggered when like if you have a table, if you update 20% of it, then it gets fired off. Or if the vacuum runs, the vacuum can also maintain statistics as well. So let me give one example of how we actually use these statistics to then compute estimations. And there's obviously going to be different formulas for all these different kind of, you know, less than, greater than, so forth that you can use. But let's, let's do the most simple one of like something equals something. So we're going to have a notion of a selectivity on a predicate, right? The predicate is where age equals 9. And that's basically what fraction of the tuples we expect for a given table are going to qualify, qualify or satisfy that predicate and therefore would be produced as output uh, for, for a given operator. All right, so if we maintain a histogram of like for all the people we have in our database, their ages, we basically want to say for the number of currents we have and the number of distinct values we have, for the predicate this age equals 9, we would just jump to this offset here and say, well, the cardinality of age equals 9 is just 4 because we have four in occurrences across the entire table. And therefore, the selectivity of this predicate is, if I have 45 tuples, 4 over 45. Right? So I can do that and say, OK, for, for given where clause on a scan, even though my table has, say, you know, 45,000, I'm going to get four tuples coming out of it as part of this predicate. And then now I can use that to determine join ordering, because I, if I apply the filter first, because I've, I've done the predicate push down, now I say, after I do my filtering, how much data do I expect to come up uh, from, from this table and feed into my, my join operator? And therefore, I can use that to determine whether one is larger than the other to change the join ordering. Something equals something, that's easy. Something equals something on a unique clause, oh, that's the best, right? Because that's, that's the easiest thing to do. It's when you have non-unique values and then non-equality non predicates. Right? A not equals would just be the reverse of this. That's easy. It's 1 minus the, the, the calculation. All right, so seems easy, right? What's the problem? Well, this, in many cases, you're going to assume uniform distribution of the data, all right? Uh, for heavy hitters, you can set, the, set them aside. Like, say, the top, most re, the top most frequent values, I'll have exact counts for those. But I don't want to store a histogram for every single possible value because if I have a billion records, a billion, one billion unique values, I don't want to store one, one, one over again that I've seen at one time. Right, you start, so you start co collapsing things down or aggregating things down to make these things more tractable. Another big assumption that a lot of systems are going to make is that they're going to assume that the predicates are, are independent. Right? Again, thinking back to the statistics class, if I have something equals something and something equals something, I'm going to assume those two predicates are independent, and therefore I just multiply the, their probabilities together to produce what I think is the global probability. But that's not always the case. And the last one, inclusion principle, just means that like, if I'm doing a join, I'm going to assume that when I join into another table, there's going to be at least one key that exists in that other table to do my match, which isn't always the case. So just to really quick, I want to show where this always goes bad uh, with this example here. Say I have a database with uh, keeping track of cars, right? And every car is going to have a make and a model. And so I have 10 makes and 10 models, or sorry, 100 models. So I have a predicate like this, where make equals Honda and model equals Accord. If I make that independence assumption and uniformity assumption, it becomes terrible. Right? Because one independence would assume that there's, there's a car, car called Accord, but it can be made by different manufacturers. But that's not true. We know Honda is the only one that makes Accord. Right? So if I assume they're independent, I take 1 over 10 and, and 1 over 100, multiply them together, and that, that gives me what the, est the estimation is of the selectivity of this predicate. But the true estimation is this. So I'm off by order of magnitude just for this like, simple example because I assume that they're independent. So there's, there's this notion of correlated statistics. You'd actually, some systems you can tell them, I know these two columns are correlated. Therefore, don't compute their statistics separately. Compute them together. But you, as a human or the operator of the system, have to tell the data system what these correlations are. It doesn't figure them out for you. Yes? Are there systems that uh, will handle this? What's that? Say it again. Computing correlated statistics. Yeah. This question is, are, th are, are there systems that are smart enough to recognize that if I'm computing make and model always and always again in the same where clause, therefore don't treat them as separate predicates or independent predicates, compute correlated statistics for them? The high-end systems might, but I don't, I don't think so. Oracle might. I don't know. The others. What's that? I just said bust up. Bust up. Well, there's, there's no notion. I don't think we, we, I don't think we even have statistics. Um, 
We'll see what project before. I don't think it does. Okay. All right. So this is a bit of a downer page. I'm just trying to say that, like, okay, this gets really hard. All right. So how do you actually can 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 calculate these statistics? What are we going to use? So the three choices are either histograms, sketches, and sampling. I want to blaze through these real quickly just to show you that these exist and the problems they can solve. Um, you know, it's not something I would cover on the exam because it, I just want to be aware of like when you get a cost estimate, where is it actually coming from? And it's going to be the, the combination of these three choices. Some systems do all of them. Some systems only do some of them. So the histogram we saw before, again, we just assume that there's, for every single unique value, we have the number of occurrences. But obviously, again, if we have a ton of unique values, then this could be really expensive right, to store a count for every single uh, value. So what you can do is you can aggregate them together uh, using what's called an equity histogram. And the idea here is that you just have these bucket ranges where you say for between one and three, I'm going to have one count, uh, four to six, I have another count, and so forth. And then now your histogram is basically aggregated together, and I can reduce the number of counts I have to store. Or so now the challenge is going to be, like if I have a, you know, a unique value, right, say I, I'm trying to look up you know, 5.5. It wasn't really my original data set, but it would land in this bucket, and I may be overestimating the number of tools that, that I actually see in there. But again, it, 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 the alternative is I distort it in that count for every unique value, and you can't do that. So this, this reduces the size quite a lot. The alternative approach is to do equidepth histograms, and the idea here is that the, the size, the range size of the buckets will be variable. I just want the count of the number of elements, the count within that bucket, to be the same. So this first range would be 1 to 5. The next range is from 6 to 8. But both cases, the count is equal to 12. So again, same thing. I'm reducing the number of, um, of unique counts I have to maintain, but again, at, at the cost of accuracy. Going back to project zero, you're asking about hyper log log. I'll answer the question afterwards. Like, what was that actually being used for? Well, you can use this for now cost estimations in your query optimizer, right? The countman sketch was the other one that we talked about. Basically, there are these probabilistic data structures that can give us approximate counts for the, the number of, of elements within some range or whether this value exists or not. And we can use that now to, to improve our accuracy of our estimates. And you can do this in combination with the histograms, or, you, or in some systems you get rid of histograms and use these sketches entirely, right? because there's a suite of sketches you can use that have the different properties that you would have in histograms. Another approach to do sampling. Now, I said before, like, oh, it's so expensive to run these queries. You wouldn't actually want to run all of them. But you kind of do a little bit of this with actually sampling. But not every system does this. The idea here is that you collect some subset of, of the original table uh, into the sample set. And that's just stored in the catalog or certain it is as if it was another table. But it's like a local copy of this. And then now when I want to do cost estimates for predicates, I'm not running the full query. I'm just running like a sequential scan on my sample. And now that's going to give me a better estimate of what the actual selectivity is. So say I do a random sampling here of this table, right? And then now when I want to evaluate, find me what's the number, number of people I expect to have, or what's the average age of people where the age is greater than, than 50? Well, now if I take my predicate here and I apply it to this sample here, well, one-third of them are going to match. So now I could use that to say, well, the selectivity of this, of this predicate is one is be one-third. And then based on that, I could determine whether it makes sense to go look up an index, if I have one, or do a sequential scan. Right? There are some systems that actually will, will use the samples to produce the actual answer of the query. You can do approximate aggregations. Uh, but again, that's, that's explicitly you have to call that in your SQL statement. Most systems won't do that for you automatically. Okay. All right, so again, this is super hard. We barely scratched the surface. I'm just kind of like a, a smorgasbord, just trying to brain dump of like, here's the things you have to consider when you're building a query optimizer in a database system. And you'll see this in, uh, in project three. You have to touch the query optimizer a little bit to do your, do your queries, but I, they're not cost-based. I think it's just rules. But at high level, what we're doing is going from a SQL plan, SQL query, to a logical plan, to a physical plan. And that physical plan could be the cost-based, or it could just be generated based on rules. There's different optimizations we can do to evaluate the expressions, to try to flatten the nested queries, and so forth. And then our cost model estimates will come from summarizations that we collect from looking at the real data. So if you like this kind of stuff, and we make a lot of money going to industry, Again, we're not teaching 721 next semester. We'll be teaching a special topics course on 799, and that'll just be entirely on query optimization. And I guarantee you that, like, I don't guarantee you, but like, you will have no problem finding a job if, if you do well in that class next semester. Okay? Any questions?
Yes. I had a question about the histogram stuff. Go for, go for it, yes. Uh, should we update it every time a tuple is entered or deleted, or only a fixed size interval for one of these things? All right, this question is, for these histograms, when are these things actually updated? You would either do it time-based, like every 12 o'clock every day, run it, or, or a, uh, like when 20% of the data has changed, then you run it. Because right, otherwise, it's too, too expensive to maintain. All right, so uh, next class, we're transitioning on to a new topic on, on transactions, concurrent control. This is the second hardest part of data about database systems. Grid optimization is the first, transactions is the, the second, because it'd be challenging to reason about correctness when like, things like the order you submit queries doesn't have to be the order you actually run them. And that's OK. OK? Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting. Too cold, a whole bowl like Smith and Wesson. One court, and my thoughts hip hop related. Write a rhyme, and my pen's intoxicated. Lyrics are quicker with a simple more liquor. Since I'm a city slicker, brain waves are quicker. Rhymes I create, rotate at a way too quick to duplicate. Fill a breeze as I skate. Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold a real tight. When I'm in flight, then we ignite. Blood starts to boil. I heat up the party for you. Let my girl rub me and my mic down with oil. Wreck still turn with third degree burn for one man. I heat up your brain, give it a suntan. So just cool, let the temperature rise. To cool it off with St. Ives. <laughs> <laughs>